is the Real Life Real Estate Investing Show, where we talk about real life real estate situations, but we bring you real life real estate solutions. And we re we've had a real life real estate situation just now, <laughs> but we we've come up with a real life real estate solution. Um, so, uh, partner, for, pardon me for being a little behind the time. We are um, operating on a few different devices, so you know we'll be we'll be making it work. Had a little bit of technical difficulty, but I could not let this opportunity pass to uh, speak to someone who I've been paying attention to for quite some time. Uh, I've been following following uh, Mr. Howard and learning quite a bit from what you're doing uh, there in Indiana, you know, doing quite a, quite a few things that you've been doing and I've been learning and watching and uh, uh, looking for the opportunity to get an opportunity to do some work with you over there. But before I go any further, I definitely want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for taking the time to be on the show today. And thank you for your patience in dealing with the uh, <laughs> technical issues that we run into, but uh, we're here, we're making it happen. Um, and I want to give you an opportunity to tell the folks a little bit about who you are and some of the things that you got going on. I, I, I'm, I'm still working on the technical situation to put your bio up. It still ain't working yet, but uh, <laughs> and the bio's not important. Uh, yeah. But, I, but I, I definitely don't want want to miss the opportunity for you to share with the folks who you are and the many things that you got going on. Oh Lord, um, you know this has just been a, this journey, man, has been a blessing. Um, I got involved in, in mortgage industry at age 19 and um, it just afforded me so many other opportunities and opened so many doors. One of the things that I found out is that um, several people uh, who are in the lower class, man, some of their challenges is was was that they really just didn't know. Um, and so when we got into the mortgage industry, you know, when I got into the mortgage industry, rather, um, it became, I couldn't get people approved because they just didn't qualify. Mm -hmm. So in order to get them qualified, I had to help them in their financial literacy. I had to teach them, you know, how to get their credit score, what a credit score was and how to get it up and, you know, the middle score. And then I had to go back and show them, you know, about debt to income ratios and that, you know, your loan to values and things to that extent. And I was 19 years old and I'm teaching people that's probably 50 years old. And it was eye opening for me, like, man, like people really don't know this stuff. And uh, so we started teaching it and I started developing a curriculum. And, you know, uh, that's how actually our Financial Freedom University was founded. And then uh, we wrote a curriculum for the NAACP. I wrote a curriculum for the National Urban League of Young Professionals there in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, then uh, I ended up on the radio and I uh, ended up on uh, WMDB uh, there in Nashville, Tennessee. And then um, I was invited to go to, um, what's 1240? I forgot the call numbers for it, but 1240. And so I was on both Christian stations there in Nashville uh, for an hour a day, every single day of the week. So every single day of the week, you would hear George Howard uh, on not one, but two different stations, my call show. And then we, you know, we had a mortgage company and they kept the doors open. And then in 2008, it was like, everything just went kabus. And uh, I, I thought I was doing well, I was 30 years old. And, you know, I just bought this, you know, million dollar house and, you know, it was $850,000, $850,000 house. And I thought I was on top of the world, man. And literally <laughs> within, I mean, I cannot, I cannot tell you that literally I walked into the office. Matter of fact, I hired another guy to, to run the office for me and I got a phone call. I said, man, you need to get to the office right away. So I'm thinking, like, what didn't happen? And we, I get to the office, and you know, nobody's lending. <laughs> and 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 this was before it was on television. This was probably a month before it was on television. And so we're like, what's going on? We call companies; they're literally out of service, literally not answering the phones, and we had no clue what was going on. Um, and then, you know, you start hearing AEs, you know, account execs from different lenders would start talking like, oh, this one shut down, this one shut down. You're like, what happened? And then about a month later, you're watching television, you're like, everything shut down, you know? <laughs> and, um, you know, I had some major, major, major challenges behind it, man. I think I went to probably the most difficult time of my life because um, I literally went from here to here overnight um, and I lost everything. And I say everything, I lost everything. I ended up literally moving back home to Gary, Indiana. And, uh, you know, moving in with my father and my mother. 
and then that didn't work and I got put out. Like literally, so now I'm on my auntie's couch. Like I'm I'm I went from like a six thousand square foot nice mini mansion to my auntie's couch in the basement. Like <laughs> literally. That your mind had expanded, so being on the couch was something that was wasn't something that you could get used to. <laughs> man, yeah. So I had to uh I seen another opportunity, man. I seen that real estate in this city was really, really, really cheap. And um and so I'm trying to get this master plan and you know, I want to get off the couch. So I moved in with my girlfriend and the relationship was wonderful. And then I moved in and then it just changed. It was like, who, who are you? Like, I, I was, is this the same? But it was, it was perfect. And um, I had to get up out of there, but I didn't want to go back to the couch. So I had some cousins, man, who were buying property at the tax sale. They knew I taught, taught real estate and they were going to the tax sale. And uh, I heard about it. I'd been to a couple seminars, but I had never actually seen it operate. And so I went and I'm looking around and it's like, it's gotta be two or 300 people in this auditorium. And, you know, they bidding and they, you know, nobody's calling out addresses. They just calling out numbers and they, they in there like literally with stickers bidding up. And I'm like, wow, oh, that's pretty cool. Right. And we went to lunch and we came back and, you know, the auctioneer was like, hey, y'all, they buying up this area over here. Y'all might want to take a chance over there. Like he was talking to the, to the audience uh, while people were still coming back from lunch. And so, uh, I took a shot at three, it was $300. So I took a shot at one, my cousin took a shot at one, my other cousin took a shot at one. And out of all three, I'm the one that ended up with a property. Wow. wow. It wasn't that cute though. It wasn't that pretty. <laughs> but boy, I was so happy. I was happy like a kid with a bag of candy, man. I was so <laughs> happy. I had this ugly house and got big. I mean, it was, man, it was just ugly. I wish I could show the picture. And- uh, Paid $300 for it though, right? Paid $300 for it and I was so happy. Uh, and uh, the, the electric was still there the plumbing was still there and uh i just had to put some tlc into it and i started doing that every weekend i would just go and i would just you know friday saturday and sunday i would literally just go and live in the house because uh, i was living in indianapolis which is about a two hour drive mm. so i would drive down after work on friday and just work on my house friday saturday sunday I had an air mattress that i kept in there and i would just work on it and about wow. four months later, man, I finally completed it. Uh, I got an offer on it for 50 grand. And I was like, wait, I paid 300. I got about 10 in it. And you're going to give me 50 for it? Right. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't hard. It wasn't hard math to figure out. Exactly. So I took that 50 and I went back to the auction. And I went back to the auction. I went back to the auction. And then I started teaching it. And I was teaching it for free on Periscope. Wow. And wow. And the response was so, you know, I was new to Periscope. I probably had like two, 300 followers. I wasn't, you know, real big. And then when I started teaching, because you know, I was teaching financial literacy. Mm -hmm. When I started teaching the real estate thing, I went from 200 to 2000 like that. Wow. Because wow. people was like, there's no way you're buying property for it. And it moved from 300 to 500 at that time to wow. $500. I was like, no, I'm really buying property for five. I had to show my deed to the camera this before we had share screen. So right. I took the deed and put it up to the camera like, this is really true, you know? And <laughs> and uh, that's been the journey, man. So, um, you know, today in like five or six years, man, I, I own over a hundred properties. Um, my, uh, well, we sold some, so I don't own a hundred properties anymore. I, uh, we purchased way over a hundred properties. Mm -hmm. um, my students have bought over 300 properties, all debt free using no credit, you know, for an average price of about $900. Um, so it's, it's been a journey. And so now we're just matriculating now to saying, okay, uh, what's the next big thing we can do? So we just put an offer in on one of the schools here for 1.8 million. And uh, we, we are the largest bid holder, uh, except we found out now that the city wants to build it. And so the city is now suing our school system. Well, I can't say suing, they're taking them to court. Mm, I, don't, okay. I don't know of another name that you can use other than sue. Right. <laughs> they're taking them to court so they can get the building without honoring the the, the auction bid process. So uh, we'll see what happens with that, but I'm really, really hoping that we get that building. We can do some great things with it. Great stuff, great stuff. Listen, man, I, like like I said, I've been following some of your journey, man, and and it's it's been you know some phenomenal stuff. And I, I you know I came across you. I think it was a member of my church a few years ago who said, um, "Yeah, like, yeah, listen to this guy. He's, he's sharing some great information." Um, and I started following you on know, following you on Facebook, and I'm like, man, I I became a student, so I you know I might have to 
then you might have to send me an invoice. I think I might owe you some money. <laughs> no, nah, man. Uh, yeah, that's what we do, man. That's, we 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 you know we partner together. We pull off each other. You know, it's not a it's not a every. It, anytime somebody believes they know everything, man, something's wrong. Absolutely. And, and you've All been right. thing, and you didn't talk to many people, and you've been doing this for so long. Uh, there's so many things that we can share with each other and both grow. So I'm happy for the relationship. Definitely, definitely. And and again, I want to I want to thank you, man, for all the stuff that you share. Um, and I, I want to kind of go back a little bit. You know, you talked about teaching financial literacy. Uh, I think that is a major key, and that's kind of where I went into. You know, because I want to I want to teach people real estate. And one of the things that you mentioned that's so important is the major thing that we miss in, in, in taking people down this educational journey to learn to invest in real estate is first how to have good credit, how to now we, you know, many people are saying, you know, you can buy a house with no money, no credit, which is OK, but that becomes a glorified job pretty much, in my opinion. Um, but when you teach people, like you said, the, the importance of having good credit, you teach them to take a, you know, a bigger view or a longer view of how they can become what I like to call real life real estate investors. That's you know, what they, they don't have they don't have to worry about money or credit and they can continuously invest for the long haul. You know, kind of start start a little bit with with um, and I want to get into the book that you wrote uh, about the you know our credit. So I want to I want to get into that. But take take me through a little bit of a journey of what it's like to begin with someone with the process. I got a little a story to tell about somebody that I helped, but I want to hear what you what you have done and helping someone to begin the process and help them become um, to the point of being able to uh, invest in those houses that you were talking about. Well, um, one, of the, one of the things I found out, man, and you know, man, that sounds so old. Uh, I, you know, I'm, 20, I'm 20 years in, man. I got, you know, I've been doing this since I was 19, I'm 44. So, uh, um, wow. Before people only, knew, only, like, only got you about three years. I'm 47. <laughs> so you know, so you you understand, right? It's like Definitely. I remember when 40 was old. And yeah, <laughs> I remember when 40 was old. Like you 40, like now, now you're like man, 40 ain't old. What's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> hey, the kids will be like, what you mean 50 old? <laughs> <laughs> I got 50 years left. I got 50 years right. left. <laughs> <laughs> but um, then one of the things, one of the best feelings in the world, man, is to see somebody when their the light bulb comes on and when their life changes. Yes. Literally, I think those are the two greatest for me, because I know that's my passion. Mm -hmm. So like one thing for somebody to get it. And then once they get it, they actually obtain it. So it's like the light bulb comes on. I got an awakening. But then mm -hmm. you take that awakening and then you actually be able to bring manifestation to something that you never thought you would get. And that's I, and and then you know, at least I know that that's going to be something that will last them at least a lifetime. But you know, it can go down through generations and generations. Uh, one of the things you just shared, uh, you were talking about, um, you know, wealth hmm. is. Um, we we had a conference. I had a I had a, a, a virtual conference the other day, and I had one of my good friends on there, Lemar Welch, and he shared something, man, that I was like, man, I never thought of it that way. And we always talk about generational wealth. Um, but one of the things that we don't talk about is generational knowledge. And if we could ever share the generational knowledge, then it would automatically create the generational wealth. And you see that, man, it blew my mind. I was like, man, because I'm always talking about generational wealth. Right. The problem is that, you know, when we don't know, we can't do. And so we know we want the money. The question is, how do we get the money? Like, where does it come from? And so there's yeah. three things that really kept people out of real estate. It was either money, it was credit or was knowledge or all three. Right. And, um, and unfortunately when you're dealing with people who are in a lower economic status, you know, typically it's all three, the, the money's not there, the credit's not there. And mm -hmm. they really don't have the knowledge because, you know, these programs are costing, you know, an absorption amount of amount of money. And then, you know, they're living check to check. Then so it's like, how do I ever get the, the money? And I don't have the money, so I don't have the credit. And I can't get the and I can't get the knowledge because I don't have the money, and it becomes a continual cycle, and it becomes perpetual. And so, how, how do you get them off? Well, thank God that I found tax liens because tax liens you don't have to have a lot of money, you know, you don't need any credit, and then if you just get the knowledge, then you can actually operate in this. And so, for me, um, helping people actually obtain that dream, man, has been so fulfilling. 
great stuff, great stuff. And, I, and you know, you know, I, I think about that, and I have I listen to myself. My my one of the things that I always say is I call instead of generational wealth, I say legacy wealth. Mm. And what that, well, how I I guess encompass all of that, the legacy wealth for me is is also teaching the knowledge. You know, leaving the knowledge that helps to continue the wealth. But what you said though is if we don't identify it as something that needs to be the, the knowledge needs to be generational i think most times people miss it because when we when they hear generational wealth they think okay this is somebody who's planning to leave a lot of money to their family um and you and i know that if you just leave money you know that money ain't gonna last too long <laughs> proverbs will tell you that man solomon said it's all vanity <laughs> he, you read the first three books of 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 Ecclesiastes, man, you would think Solomon was mean. Like he was just, it's all vanity. Like, whoa, so this, <laughs> one of these to nine, work my whole life to obtain this mass amount of wealth and I can give it to my son and it's gone in a day. Exactly, and exactly. that is so true. Yeah. So you can hand that, that money over if you want to. That, that, leads me, that leads me to another thing, man. Um, financial Moses. <laughs> uh, brother listen i gotta tell you man i, I gotta tell you and, and from learning what i learned from you man and following you i would i would certainly have probably given you that title had you not had it already <laughs> well so tell, tell the folks a little bit about that man i mean because I mean, you know what you do and the things that you offer is you know definitely earns you the right to say yourself call yourself the financial moses how, how did that come about though it, it actually was given to me I, um you know I was on the air for five years, you know, every day teaching financial literacy. And um, I was at a, a housing event. I can't think of what, I think it was Woodbine. It's at a housing event. <clears throat> and we we actually had partnered with the people who had hosted it. So when you walked in, your banner was stretched across the thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm in the office talking to the woman who owned the building and was hosting it. And uh, we're in there, you know, we're chatting up and one of my staff people came and knocked on the door and said, hey, there's a young lady who would like to speak with you. I said, okay, we'll let her know I'll be there in a minute. So I come out and um, and I said, yes, ma'am, how can I help you? They bring me to her. So how can I help you? And she said, I need to talk to that guy. And she's pointing to my banner. And I was like, yes, ma'am, how can I help you? No, I need to talk to that guy. <laughs> and I'm just like, yes, ma'am, how, how can I help you? I'm George Howard. No. I need to talk to George Howard. That one, that guy, and he's still pointing to my banner. And it's like the third or fourth time I'm telling her, how can I help you, right? So finally she says, I want to talk to George Howard. I said, ma'am, I am George Howard. And uh, the look on her face and the shock. And she was like, but you're so young. Right. <laughs> and then she was like, "You're," and this is, she literally said, she's like, you know, I always thought him like a financial Moses, but you're, you're just so young. And when mm. she said it, wow. I was like, man, that kind of stuck. Financial wow. Moses, you know? So I think she had me as this old gray head guy with a cane and, you know, out comes this 23, 24 year old, you know, right. and <laughs> she's like, no, I need to talk to him. And I'm like, that's me. And she's like, no way. And she's like, I always just thought of you were like a financial Moses. And so um, it, the name just kind of stuck over the years. Um, but, you know, one of the things that we talk about, you know, in, in at least in the church that, you know, churches that I attend or listen to, is that you know coming out of poverty and is about kingdom mindset. And by the by the way, y'all don't know. Um, I hope I'm not offensive to anybody, but I really believe what I believe, and uh, I walk in what I believe. I think this is my calling. Let, let, let me say something right there, brother. Go ahead. Listen, if we get to the point of worrying about offending people by by first of all sharing what we know and giving what we have and and believing what we believe, then we're not doing him no service. You see, I can tell you this. If yeah. it's okay on this show, we believe what we believe and we gonna talk about it. <laughs> well, I can tell you this, I've been on other shows, man, where they're like, well, you know, you know, and you can tell they want you to kind of tone it down. They don't say it. They mm -hmm. just kind of turn the conversation another direction. I'm like, well, I just want y'all to know that, right. you know, <laughs> and I have to let people know, man, seriously, there's no way that I could have done what I've done uh, in my life without him. Seriously, really? for me to have, you know, most people trying to pay off one house in their life and we have a hundred, you know. Yeah. Uh, and we did it in like five years. That is unheard of. Um, so I, I have to give him glory. But one of the things that I found out, man, is um, we talk and preach prosperity in the churches, but we're not telling people how to actually do it. 
Mm. I say that. I say that. Yes, it did. So yeah, they said God gonna bless you. Yeah, but how? Yeah, you know, you, yeah. you're the head, not the tail. Okay, how do we get there? Because I feel like the tail, but I'm supposed to be the head. How do I get there? You Absolutely. know, you're the lender, not the borrower. Well, I can't. You know, the they, they become almost cliches because there's no path. There's Absolutely. no. There's no. There's no vehicle that's going to take me from the tail to the head, from the borrower to the lender. What's the path? Right. And so, um. I know for a fact that that's the calling on my life that God has, you know, you have people that's, that's in the ministry and their, their gift is tongues or prophecy or interpretation of tongues or healing or, you know, mine is finance. I'm, I'm, I'm a ministry of finance. And right. if you want to a ministry of wealth, whatever you want to call it. And so, and I take it quite seriously. And I believe that that's why God has continued to, you know, I guess expound my ministry. And it's like, as he take my ministry farther, he takes me further. Right. And um, it's just been one of those those things, man. But we can't talk about the land of not enough, you know, Egypt, you know, the land of just enough, and, you know, the wilderness, you know, where they ate manna. And then you talk about the land of more than enough trying to get to Canaan. And so, right. you know, who was it that brought him out of Egypt and was supposed to take him into Canaan? Well, it was Moses. And so when I look at people today, I'm saying, you know, people don't know it. But, you know, when you read Exodus chapter three, the Bible says actually chapter two, um, Bible is very prolific in the agonizing and the pain that the children of Israel were in and they were calling out to God and Bible says God, you know, hurry said he hurt them and sing their misery. And one of the challenges that we have today is that, you know, we're toiling. I mean, the same way that the Egyptians was going to work every day toiling, they were slaves though. I think yeah. now we're, 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 I think we're more mental slaves because we're slaves to debt, not to a job. You're not slaves to your job guys, by the way, you're slaves to debt. If you got rid of the debt, you'll be free from your job. What's bound to you right now is your debt. And uh, and so God is sending me uh, as, a, as an instrument. And, you know, unfortunately, sometimes I feel like Hosea, um, when he, he, he had to go down to the, the prostitute and marry the prostitute, you know, God has taken me through some very challenging economic times. And he said, okay, now go preach it. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> right? Seriously, like, I, I mean, I've been up, I've been down, I've been around the mountain, you you name it. And, you know, and then God's like, okay, now you can identify. And, I'm, and this is real talk, Glenn. When I, when I was uh, in Nashville and I bought the, you know, the $850,000 house, I'm 27 years old. I'm making, you know, $50,000 a month. I'm 27. I'm doing well, man. And, you know, mm -hmm. I authored my own book and, um, you know, I'm doing conferences around the country. Nobody at this time, the internet wasn't like it is now. So this right. was unheard, exactly. especially for a guy who was black and young. And, and yeah. Uh, you right? Yeah. yeah. And so um, <laughs> I thought I was on top of the world. I just like literally, and it started off as ministry to me. And somewhere, I don't know where I took that pivot, that turn, and it turned into economics and growth and trying to grow your business and about numbers. Mm -hmm. And I really believe, man, that if I had not have had the experiences that I had where I lost everything that uh, I would have not be in my ministry, I, I had turned that corner. And so when I lost everything, I had forgot what it was like to be broke. I, and wow. I, can, no longer, I can no longer identify with the people. Or... <laughs> and so to go through that journey of homelessness, to go to that journey of sleeping on my auntie's couch, go to that journey of sleeping in an abandoned house while I work on it, and trying to get that muster that it helped me now have another reality of what it's like to identify with the people that I'm called to. And mm -hmm. so now that God is escalating me again, I will never forget, you know, I'm not going to repeat history. I'm not going to forget, you know, what that's like and what people are like, you know, for somebody to come up with a hundred dollars. I mean, I remember when $25 was a lot of money. I'm talking about that was a lot of money, like $25. I was ready to fight. Like, right. man, you my twenty five dollars, <laughs> like for real, you know. And then, you know, and if you ever forget that, man, you can't identify with your people because it, it's it, it's 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 heartbreaking at one time, but at the same time, it's also motivation to say you still got work to do. Definitely, definitely. You know, and you know, I, the reason why I, I I you know laugh when you said that is because during that time, you know, that time of two thousand eight, man. Um, God, God actually and I and I, I identify with what you're saying, you know, it's a <laughs> breaking process. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I was you know, I was up like those years, you know, I've been I've been in the twenty two years, so I was up you know, making tons of money. I I, I didn't buy the eight hundred and fifty thousand dollar house, you know. 
I, I wanted I wanted to get all the other nice little trinkets, motorcycles, cars. <laughs> <and everything. laughs> so um, do, after doing really well, and then that crash came, I was like, whoa, you know. Now I, I don't have the, the story that many people have is that they lost everything. I was fortunate to be able to have sold everything. I had like 17, 18 houses at the time, and I sold them all. And the, I sold the last one February two thousand eight. So I, I had a lot of money still, so I was cash rich, but asset poor. But I had no, no no recurring income, no money coming in, you know, everything going out, paying bills, traveling, doing different things. Um, but what happened, at, 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 you know, I came to the point, I went from, you know, a, a exuberant amount of money from to the beginning of 2008 to almost just about $5,000 in my bank account, the end of 2009. And, uh, you know, literally 2010, I asked my wife to marry me. She said, yes. So I think, you know, she was crazy and not me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Congratulations, <laughs> though. Go ahead. But I, I, I say that to say I, I literally had to go from what I was doing in real estate to cutting grass to even. Wow. Make a, That's only I heard a ring. You know, um, and many people may know me, don't know that, know that story. But I share that to say. When you say you had to be able to relate to people, it was a lady working in my office before the crash happened. And, you know, she she had all these issues with money and things like that. You know, she was actually living in one of my houses. So she was working for me for the rent for the house. Mm -hmm. I always say, oh, this is wrong and that's wrong and this is wrong and this wrong. And I was on such a high at the time. And, you know, learning in different things, my 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 high was just get over it and make it happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what I realized after that humbling experience, you know, I said I call it God showing me me. Like, dude, right. you've that's good. Always been here. You know what I mean? This ain't this ain't what your life has always been about. Let me bring you back to remind you yes. that that's where this well, this this woman was. You know, and show you that you got it. You got to work to get to it again. You know, so I definitely I definitely can relate to that. Man. You know, it was a humbling experience. And it's, it's still humbling even to talk about it or think about it, man, you know, and sometimes you like, you want to shy away from it. Like, you know, I want to tell people I was homeless or I slept on my auntie's couch in a basement, you know, but it's part of my story. Right. And if I don't ever tell the story, then I never give him glory because people really? think I did this by myself and I didn't, this was nothing with the hand of God, nothing. Man, man, man. Listen, we, we can have this conversation all day long. All bro. day long. We've been here preaching. <laughs> <laughs> Let's let's get into. Um, I want to get into the meat. I know some people looking for what. What about the tax lease? What about the tax lease? Okay. Let's talk about um, uh, Financial Freedom University. Well, FFU man. Um, we I actually started off with my brother. My brother was actually teaching prosperity when it was not popular. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm talking about this would have been. I started in '97, '98 in the mortgage industry. And so in like 96, maybe 95, he was traveling the country teaching prosperity. Mm, okay, okay. This is way before it became popular. Um, and when I when I moved to Nashville, I moved to Nashville in 99. Um, I was, of course, I was a member of his church and he was teaching what's called breakthrough ministry. He was giving people a financial breakthrough. And uh, he wanted to redo this curriculum. And so we sat down, me, him, and another young lady sat down and rewrote the whole curriculum. And so in the middle of that curriculum, um, we sat down and while we were teaching it, and another young lady from the National, from the Urban League of Young Professionals came through and was like, hey, will you come teach? I said, well, this is not my curriculum. You know, this is my brother's. She said, okay, well, write one. So I was like, well, I wrote this one. So I wrote another one. So right. I taught that one. And a woman from the NAACP was at that one. And said, so, well, will you come on the NAACP and teach? So wow. I'm like, okay. Like, you know, now, you know, these, <laughs> again, I'm young still. And uh, yeah. so I'm like, okay. So I went over there and talked that one. And so one day, seriously, we were, you know, going over metrics and data. And, uh, you know, I was on both Christian stations in, in Nashville. And, uh, and these were like black gospel stations. Mm. And we're, we're sitting there and we're going over the numbers. And, man, my heart bled. Seriously, because I don't know the data for this one. So I'm just going to guess because I don't have any scientific proof. But I want to say about 90% of my people were Black and Christian. Because mm -hmm. they found me through Black Christian radio. 
Right. right. Um, and out of about maybe about 150 to 200 credit reports we had pulled that month, um, now it had to be more than that. It had to be like four or about 400 credit reports we pulled that month. We had denied like 275, 300. Wow. Now, Glenn, wow. you remember this time where literally we had a saying that if you can breathe on glass, you can get a loan. <laughs> like, it was like, hey, chew. oh, you're approved. Like, <laughs> like, seriously, like, you know, and then, and, and I'm sitting here with Christians who look like me and they're all getting denied. Yeah. And yeah. so that's when I say, you know what, we're going to start teaching again. And I opened Financial Freedom University and we took all those people and we put them in FFU. We charged them $10 a week to teach them. Uh, wow. That was enough to pay my staff and pay for the building. Mm -hmm. And we taught them $10 a week to teach them. And it became a, like a revolving door because it would come from radio station. It would come to the mortgage company. If they got denied, we sent them to FFU. We would train mm -hmm. them. They come back around. They would actually get their loan, get approved. And it was a very good thing, right? <laughs> it became right. Like a, a feeder for, you know, my mortgage company. And so um, wow. Wow. that's how Financial Freedom University was actually founded. And then we just took it virtual um, when we actually... 2015 I believe we took it virtual maybe 16 we started back up again and uh now we can it's not now it's not about having the building or renting the basement of a church and having people come there yeah. now I can reach the world uh on platforms like yours man so thank you for having me on here I really appreciate it absolutely yeah I mean it, it's you know I would definitely say it's long overdue I think we communicated about doing this some time ago. And I was like, man, I need to make room for this guy so he can come on and share what he knows. Um, so listen, that is phenomenal, man. You know, and that's, I think, a bigger piece of, you know, those of us that are educators, uh, helping people see the bigger picture of what it is that they're looking to accomplish. You know, most times people look at, you know, those of us that teach and they say, okay, well, it costs this and it costs that and I'm never going to be able to do it. Not realizing the value behind what we're offering is something that you mentioned earlier that is generational. You yes, know? Sir. yes, sir. You know, not just looking at, you know, okay, this can make me a little bit of money for a little bit of time. Like, yo, what you what you'll learn from what we're sharing with you is something that you can take for the rest of your life and share with your children and your children's children. You know, so it's, it's definitely phenomenal with what you're doing with that. Well, you know, I heard um, Miles Monroe, you guys, if y'all don't listen to Miles Monroe, you're missing such a, I've been listening to Miles now 25, 30 years. I don't know, since I've been in the ministry. Um, but I can listen to his stuff, man, over and over again. But he, he Miles said, shared this. He said, you know, the Bible says that, you know, a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. Of course, we all heard that, right? right. He said, what asset who will transition to two generations, actually three generations. Mm -hmm. I never thought about it before. I just said, you know, good man leaves inheritance for his children's children. But now he's like, okay, what is it? That car ain't gonna make it three generations. Right. That mink right. ain't gonna make it three generations. You hope grandma's ring gonna make it three generations. Right. <laughs> so what is God talking about? And he said, land. I said, Boy, you sure right, Bob. <laughs> he said, it's land, it's real estate. Absolutely. That's going to be. And then, then he broke it down and said, even when you start saying um, a state, and then you say real wow. estate, it's the only a state that's real. What is a state? A state is something of value that is still here when you're gone. And the only thing that's real is real estate. Oh my God, I love my house, man. I'm telling you. What are you preaching about, man? You I brought that for Miles. I just, I'm regurgitating. That's all, that's all that is. But it's, it's something that we need to be reminded of, though. You know, I mean, that's something that, like, when you break it down like that, you know, myself, I mean, it's, 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 it's you know, another word, I mean, it's empowering to me to understand that all over again. And I hope the folks that are watching this or that will listen to this, can can really conceptualize what you just said. You know, the the only estate that's real is real estate. You know, because you said many of those other things and trinkets probably won't last the generations. You know, so I mean, great, great stuff. Thank you for thank you for listening to my. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for being a student that became the teacher. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, well, you do it all the time, so it's okay. <laughs>
So let's let's talk about um let's 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 get into the, you know some of what the folks are coming to coming to listen to. Let's talk about uh the tax liens. Okay. Uh, and and doing what you do specifically in Gary, Indiana. Um, I met another gentleman that is doing some of that over there, and we're actually looking to connect and do some things over there as well. So tell us, how does that process work? So people are 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 under, trying to understand tax liens, tax deeds, tax certificates, all these different things. Can you explain to the audience what the difference in these are and how they work and what you're doing and how you can help other folks get started doing that? Yeah, definitely. Um, <clears throat> Let's start with kind of the concept and then mm -hmm. we'll talk about what I'm doing here locally. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So guys, back in the 1700s, they were having problems collecting property taxes. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm going to try to make this as short as possible and make it as simplistic as possible. Mm -hmm. um, they were having problems collecting property taxes. And so somebody came up with an idea and they said, well, let's penalize them if they're late. They said, good idea you know and so they put a penalty like if you're late you're gonna have a, a penalty you know use the interest rate 10 percent or something like that well okay you gave me a 10 percent penalty but didn't mean anything right. so <clears throat> they came up with said okay well since they got a penalty or interest rate we can, it now becomes an asset mm -hmm. so we can sell that to an investor and they'll pay the taxes they'll get the the interest rate back from the other people when they pay it mm. so it'll work out we get our taxes they get the you know they get like less a little bit more time to come up with the money the investor is going to get a percentage of the you know a, a large percentage on their return it's supposed to be working out well well uh this actually came out as uh the feudal system back in the day from the you know early back in the day right <laughs> the feudal system with kings oh, and okay. <laughs> Kings, lords, and priests. Now I want to put no no time error on it. Um, yeah. The feudal system. If that if you didn't pay your taxes, it it reverted back to the king, mm -hmm. and then the king would give it to somebody else who would work the land and give him gifts and all that kind of stuff. And if you don't pay right. your taxes, the king gonna take it back and give it to somebody else. Right. Well, that's kind of what they did here in America. They said, mm -hmm. okay, well, this guy just paid your taxes for you. If you don't pay him back, plus give him an interest rate, then we're gonna take your land and give it to him. Because he's mm -hmm. going to pay taxes, and so that started in the 1700s. And um, one of the things that I call tax lien certificates or tax deeds or tax liens, I call it America's call it two things. Number one, America's biggest secret, the you know yeah. greatest secret, biggest secret. Um, because I don't understand how, you know, we all heard the Federal Reserve System, but it was it was born a whole lot after. Tax lien certificates. We are we all heard of Wall Street. It was born after tax lien certificates, mm. but nobody heard of tax lien certificates. You know, it's literally every state in the country has met with their Senate, with their House, and their governor. They have passed a bill, passed legislation. The governor has signed it, so it is legislation in your in in your state. It is passed down to the county so that they can carry out the legislation that's been passed. Mm -hmm. It is publicized in the paper at least twice. It's at the auction, it's at the courthouse, and they're selling real estate dead free at the courthouse. It's publicized in the paper. It's going through a whole legitimate legal process. And you're telling me nobody's heard of this? Right. Nobody knows how to do this. They kept it a secret for a reason, and they kept it a secret because the investment is just that good, which the second thing I call it is America's best investment. You're yeah. telling me that you're going to give me 10% to 25% returns, and if I don't get the returns, I'm going to get the house debt free? <laughs> How could you lose? <laughs> so you're securing my investment against real estate? Wow. Wow. Nobody wanted to talk about it because, number one, there's no commission being made off of it. Uh, mm -hmm. So why would you sell it? Because so you know, and number two, the people who knew how it was just too good of an investment to let everybody else know about it. Right, right. So um, that's kind of like how it started, right? And so if you don't, and when people don't pay the taxes, you guys, um, the county can't survive. Like how property taxes is probably the number one way that your county receives the majority of its income. Not that it receives other income, but the majority of the money 
coming in from to your county is going to be through property taxes. Um, that funds your school system. It's going to fund your roads. Going to fund the county jail, the county court, the county courthouse, the county hospital, the county parks. It's going to, I mean, you name it. The sheriff's office, the jail. It's going to fund all of that. And if they don't have funds, they can't run these systems. Right. right. And so, um, they invented taxing certificates. And so, what happens is that some states will say, "We're going to sell their house at the auction." Like that means that when you go to the auction, they're five years behind in taxes and every state is different, right? Some are two years, some are five years, but they're five years behind in taxes. They're not going to pay. So it's going to revert back to the king and we're going to sell it. And whoever buys it, you can buy it. But just remember how you got it. If you don't pay these taxes, we're going to take it from you too. Absolutely. <laughs> right? So those states are called deed sales. I mean, deed states, because you're leaving the auction with the deed, mm. right? Mm -hmm. There, there's like you literally leave with a piece of paper. You go knock on the door and say, "Hey, I'm your new owner. How you doing?" Right. Right. <laughs> but then there's other states who met and they passed legislation, and that legislation said, "Well, we're not going to just sell the property. We want to give the homeowner a chance. Mm -hmm. So we're going to give them a period of time where they can buy their property back. Right. That period of time is called a redemption period." Mm -hmm. Right. So they get so much time to redeem. There's some states are as short as, you know, 60 days to redeem. And they have some as long as three years to redeem. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, depending on the state, it could be a lean state. It could be a D state. Um, and when you go to like a lean auction, you're not buying the property. You're buying a lien against the property. And so the first person that's going to ever get paid on that property is going to be you because you own the first lien position because the county took first lien position. That's a whole other way to how they got there, right? But the county took first lien position. That's it. I mean, when I say that's against a mortgage, that's against a second mortgage, that's against a, your business loan, your signature loan, that boat, that business you started, you put all these liens against your houses, the mechanical lien. Nope. That, that lien, that county lien is jumped in front of all of those so wow. that if they don't pay, you get the property debt free, even though all those other loans or liens are against it. Absolutely. And so um, that's called a lien sale. So, you know, either you're going to make your money back plus whatever the interest rate in that state is. So my state is 10%, uh, Florida is 18, Texas is 25, Georgia is 18, uh, Iowa's 24. Um, you know, and it just, it, it varies throughout the whole country. Uh, I think Alabama is 12, um, Mississippi, I think is 12. And, you know, these are solid interest rate, Glenn. Uh, when you start looking at, you know, your IRA, your 401k, uh, your right. 403b or whatever it is, man, they're giving you four to 6% returns. And you tell me right. I can get these double digit returns. And if I don't get it, I get the house debt free. Exactly. And that's yeah. crazy. And so they have what's called deed states. Those are states that, you know, you get the property now. Then you have mm -hmm. lien states that it's a redemption period. And based on that state legislature that they passed, it could be, you know, 60 days or three years, depending on your state. Um, and then finally, they have what's called hybrids. Hybrids are states that said, well, we're going to let you have the deed at the auction, but we're still going to let them have a chance to redeem, right? Mm -hmm. And so they mix the two together. They mix the D state and the lean state together. Those are states like Georgia. It's a hybrid state. Hawaii is a hybrid state. Um, uh, actually, even Texas is a hybrid state, believe it or not. And wow. so... Um, those are like the three different states, the three different types of auctions that there are. You have these states, you take the property now. Uh, they're going to be more expensive because you're actually buying the house. Mm -hmm. um, then you have lien states. They're going to be a little bit cheaper. You're buying a lien against the house. That's what I was doing for $300. I bought mm -hmm. a lien against the house. They didn't pay me my money back plus my interest rate. I got the house debt free. And then you have a hybrid states. Now, those are the three different types of states and that you can attend your local auction. And guys, I'm serious. Just type in on your computer your city, mm -hmm county and tax sale and see what comes up for you you'll be surprised wow wow so so in all of that um so tax liens and tax deeds so for some people that may watch this or may listen to this um many people are here many people hear tax certificates mm -hmm. uh, so how does tax certificates relate to tax liens and tax deeds could you explain that i can so it's almost like bond stock Mm -hmm. So if I go and I get buy Nike stocks, Nike is going to send me a, well, for about a large share. They're going to send me a certificate yeah. of that stock, right? right? I have something tangible that I can hold in my hand to say, I own something in Nike. 
All right. It's not like the digital apps now. This is back old school. <laughs> right. Well, when you go to a tax sale, a tax lien sale, well, they're going to give you a certificate to say that you own an asset, a lien against a property that's worth this much money. And mm -hmm. so you get that certificate and it's literally an asset. And if they don't redeem, I go turn that certificate in and they give me my property. In fact, if they do redeem, I still got to turn that certificate in. They're going to give me my money back plus my interest rate. Yes, yes. And that certificate, I have to hand that in because I'm exchanging something of value for something that's more of a tangible value. Either it's going to be a house or it's going to be my return on my investment. So you usually get a certificate from that county um, that that will reckon that county recognize that now you own an asset. Great, great stuff. Great stuff. Thanks for explaining that. Uh, so what's happening with where you are in Gary and Dan? What, what's happening there? How are you doing what you're doing? How can we get a $300, $300 house or $500? House? How can we do that? Well, some big mob guy kept getting on the internet talking about Gary was the best place to invest and he bought houses <laughs> for $300. So now, <laughs> those days is gone. Right? <laughs> um, seriously, man, it's a beautiful thing, though. Seriously, I, I remember when people laughed at me about four or five years ago, I started doing webinars. Literally, I advertised them across Facebook, doing webinars, the second best city in the country to invest in. Mm -hmm. And people literally laughed at me. It was like Gary, Indiana. Man, nobody want to invest in Gary. Right. <laughs> okay. And then I started showing people how I went from homeless to over a millionaire uh, mm -hmm. investing in the city. And I think it caught some people's attention. Like, wait a minute, this, it might be onto something. Um, but one of the things that I love about my city, man, is that it really is the crossroads of America. That's the name that we have, but it really is. We have four major interstates. I mean, major interstates. 65 literally is maybe a half a mile down the street. And it ends a half a mile down the street. Wow. Or maybe it begins. I don't know if it ends or begins. It's, it's, the end, the, the, whatever it is, it, it stops. <laughs> to you, right. <laughs> right there, right? So um, it ends right down there, guys. If you don't know, I can get on 65 and it will take me all the way to Alabama. Um, and then we have 80, which goes, um, you know, that's, you know, 65 is north and south. I got 80 that's going to take me east and west. Mm -hmm. I have um, 90 that's going to take me east and west. I'm talking about like from Maine all the way over to Michigan. Uh, we're yeah. talking about um, another one, and I can't, I don't know which interstate it is. It's going to take me from California all the way over to, if I'm not mistaken, like New York or something. And it comes straight through Gary, Indiana. Wow. So we got 80, we have 65, we have 90, we have 94. And they all go mm -hmm. east, west, north, and south, and it comes straight through Gary. You cannot make it from one end of the country, whether you're going north or south or east or west, without going through Gary, Indiana. It's just wow. impossible. Yeah. Well, I can say it's impossible. You can take the long way around, but you know, <laughs> but it would be better off going through your Indiana. Uh -huh. Well, in addition to that, um, we're on Lake Michigan. So mm -hmm. the only thing that separates us from Chicago is Lake Michigan. Wow. I can literally get on 90 and I can be downtown. I ain't talking in Chicago. I can be in Chicago in 15 minutes. I can be downtown Chicago in 30 minutes. I'm going to say it again. I can be in the second largest city in the whole country in 30 minutes. Wow. Wow. The only thing that separates it is the lake. I'm going somewhere with this. We have more square footage per train track. I mean, we have more train track per, per square mile than any other city in the country because we have the meals here. Yeah. And then we have our own airport. So what am I saying? I'm saying that we have every major export and import that the city can want. You have your mm. own airport that flies in cargo. You have your ships on the lake. You have trains to move in, you know, industry in and with, with, you know, product in and out or, you know, industry in and out. You have every highway as trucking. So mm. every resource that you want for a city, we're sitting in and then we're 30 minutes from the largest or 15 minutes from the large, the second largest city in the country. Wow. 30 minutes from downtown. Yeah. People try, commute farther than 30 minutes a day. You're right. You're right. So I think that we're positioned to be uh, gentrified. And, mm -hmm. I, and you know, we own that water, man. Rich people want that water. You Good know? Stuff. Stuff. So for me and me knowing a little bit about real estate, I said, man, eventually somebody coming back to get Gary because Gary mm -hmm. is, is dying. And I'm talking about his on life support. Wow. And I think it's intentional, you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we can go somewhere else when it, I, I actually believe that Gary has been, is a victim uh, of predatory lending. 
right now, currently. And I heard, heard that as well, yeah. Well, you can't get loans in the city. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason why is because most lenders have a minimum loan amount. Right. Who says that, you know, we will not do a loan less than $50,000 because we don't make no money on loans less than $50,000. Right. Well, the average value in Gary is about $50,000. Right. So if the maximum that you're going to lend against is 50000 and you're going to give me 80% of that. Right. You know. Exactly. So the most I can get is 40, but your minimum is 50. I don't qualify. Right. That throughout the entire city, man. So it's like, how can grandma go pull equity out of her home? She can't. Right. Auntie, right. you know, send me, you know, people, equity, man, generates wealth. I don't care what you say, what you call it, how you do it. But right. the problem is that it's stuck in your house. And um, if you can't access that wealth out in your house, then it's not wealth. That's another topic. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> it's tough, though. It's tough. <laughs> Seriously, it's like, so give me a winning lottery ticket and tell me I can't cash it. Right. <laughs> it's not a winning lottery ticket. It's only, I'm only a winner when somebody acknowledges me as the winner. And I, yeah. Equity, when somebody acknowledges that it's money. Right, right, right. Wow, wow. And so Katrina happened, right? Mm -hmm. Back in, what was it, 2004? Yeah. Katrina happened, I believe. And uh, I had my mortgage company then, and I hired a young lady from New Orleans. Her name was Tamika. And um, she began sharing with me, she said, George, people in New Orleans are not, they're not broke. No, she said, they're poor, but they're not. No, they're broke, but they're not poor. I said, what do you mm -hmm. mean? And she said, most people in New Orleans, their homes are paid for. They're mm. handed down. So wow. the problem is that, and she, this is what she told me, I'm telling you, because I was on the radio teaching this stuff, and so I, I actually told her, come on the show, tell the story. And, mm. um, and she said, the reason people couldn't get out of New Orleans wasn't because they didn't have money, it's because they couldn't get it out of their house. Wow, wow. They paid off the house, they got $100,000 sitting in their house, or $50,000 sitting in that house, and now the storm is coming and they have no cash. Like you said, you was cash rich, asset poor. Right. They right. are asset poor, I mean, asset rich and cash poor. Wow. You got money, but I can't touch it because I have to qualify to touch my own money. Exactly, exactly. Well, I yeah. think Gary Indiana is going through the same thing. And I think it's intentional. I think they're literally starving it, starving it out, going to come in, buy it as cheap as possible. And then, you know, what you always see in these other Communities have been gentrified. You're gonna look up, and it's gonna be four, or five thousand, hundred, four, five hundred thousand dollar property sitting right here, going down Broadway. Um, oh. You know, and it's sad because the the sad thing is that you know there are people who are already here who don't even recognize the value of the land they're already sitting on. Man, uh, that's I, I said that I'm originally from Detroit, and I grew up in a. In oh, you from the D? You know exactly yeah. what I'm talking about. <laughs> So I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. It's, it's many people there who have those houses that are 20, 30, you know, maybe $40,000 of value and can't do anything with it, you know, yep. because they have access to the, the money in them, you know, so. And watch this, Glenn. If you want to sell it, how's somebody going to buy it if they can't get a loan for it? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, you're right. stuck. Yeah. I can't yeah. refinance. I can't sell. Like, unless somebody's going to give them cash money. Are they going to get private lending? Mm -hmm. They're not mm -hmm. going to qualify. Like it's it's sad, man. I, I don't. It's one one of the things that they were doing in Detroit. Um, some of the you know wealthier people, actually some of the people who run Detroit, pretty much, were creating the value by selling on seller finance. So if they sell on seller finance, they say, okay, I'm selling this house for we'll say eighty thousand uh dollars. Oh, here we go. I'm about to say I lost you, Glenn. There you go. I Okay. Yeah, we're selling this house for eighty thousand dollars. I mean, it may only be worth thirty now, but we're selling it for eighty in the next, we'll call it five years. Um, that were thereby they were creating the value so that those values in the neighborhood would go up. So some of those people could then refinance and get loans. It you know, it was it was it was uh some some wise something they came up with that, to make it work. <laughs> that don't work no more. Now you gotta actually right. put it on the market. But right. um, yeah, uh I know because we tried the same thing. <laughs> I know because I was like, you know what? We're going to take this whole neighborhood and we're going to help people get some. So we took five houses, put them on land contracts, and I'm waiting for them. Yeah. You know, and they, it did it. You can look at it in Google, put it in the county records right now. There was properties that come up. Oh, it sold for $150,000. Exactly. You know? 
And we we literally went in and we you know fixed the house up and we you know sold it for one hundred fifty thousand dollars on a land contract. And we thought that appraisers would use it and they're not using those values. They say, no, you need to put it in an MLS. You need to actually have a, a, a transaction at a title company. And then we will actually be able to use that. I'm like, for me, I, I think that that's, um, I think it's a violation of your rights. Uh, mm -hmm. Either way, whether I'm financing it or a major bank is financing it, either way it goes, it's a real sale. It's a legitimate it's, sale. You're right. It's you're making legitimate payments. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's just another way, man, to be able to control um, how that happens in our community. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's talk about um, the books that you wrote, and let's start, you know tell the folks how they can get those. Uh, uh, yeah, sure. So, uh, I didn't tell the whole story, right? So, when I started working at a mortgage company, at age nineteen, I didn't know my my, my best friend actually one that was running my mortgage company in, in Tennessee. Uh, I was at Purdue University in West Lafayette, Indiana. And so he drove from Gary. It's about an hour drive. He drove from Gary to Purdue. And uh, he knocks on my apartment door. I didn't know he's coming. And he just smiled. I'm like, man, what's wrong with you? What, it's been all cheese in your face. Like, what's, you got a girlfriend? What, what, what's going on? And she, she'd be like, what's going on, right? <laughs> and um, he pulls out this check. And he's just grinning and he gives it to me. He hasn't, he hasn't said nothing. He's just grinning. And I look at it and it's $3,500. Mm -hmm. Now, this is in 1995. And we're 19 years old. <laughs> do you know what $3,500 was to a 19 year old in 1995? Man, I was gold. I'm like, how did you get this? What did you do? Is this real? Right. And he's like, yeah. I'm like, what are you doing? He said, I'm a loan officer. What's that? I do mortgages. What's that? I didn't yeah. know what a mortgage was. And so uh, he takes me over and he takes me over to a black company. Uh, and God name, I won't say his name, but he owns seven mortgage companies in Chicago back then. Wow. wow. And a uh, multimillionaire, and he takes me over and he uh, introduced me to him. A guy was down to earth and he said, what do you do? I said, I work for PNC Bank. I'm a credit analyst. He said, you're a credit analyst. And he takes a, a, fo a folder, literally, he just reached over, we're in Lemar's office. He takes a folder, picks it up, and he throws it across the office and I catch it. He said, read the credit report. Okay. So, I, you know, I read the credit report. He said, you want a job? Well, yeah. I just seen this check for $3,500. Are you crazy? Yeah, I want a job. And so I would literally, again, drive on the weekends to Chicago, and I would make phone calls, pipelines, and all that, and I would go back to Purdue, and I would work those loans, and I would send them to a product. If I sold them, I would send them to the processor, and I was going back and forth for an hour and a half commute as a loan officer, literally from Purdue University. And that's how I got started. Wow. Uh, I ended up moving to Nashville, Tennessee, and I went to American Baptist Theological Seminary mm -hmm. and uh, for my theological degree, my theology degree. And uh, I got there and I worked, uh, I was hired as a regional vice president with Bank of America. So they mm -hmm. sent me down to Dallas Fort Worth for training and they flew me in. I feel like I'm big stuff. I'm 20 years, I'm 20, like literally, I'm literally 20, 21 years old, 21. 21 years old and got my own cell phone. This is when cell phones you didn't have. I got my own cell phone, got my own laptop. Yeah. They me across the country. I'm like, whoa, I didn't made it, baby. I didn't made it. Mom will be so proud. And I got there and I'm sitting in this class. I'm the only black person. And they start talking about predatory lending. And I found out that what Lemar and I were trained to do to our own people was predatory lending. Mm. Wow. Wow. And I'm sitting there literally with sweat, like literally coming down the side of my face because I'm like, Wow. So one of the things that we were doing, man, we were doing things like, you know, premium yield spread. You can qualify. We never told people to the interest rate they qualify for. You know, yeah. I've been an officer for a couple of years. I know about this. Yeah, man. You qualify for six percent, but I'm gonna sell you this eight percent. But I never told you I was selling you an eight percent loan. I just told you you qualified, and here's your rate. Right. And I'm making two percent right. off the front and then we're making two percent off the back. So on this two hundred thousand dollar loan, I just made eight thousand dollars and I'm yeah. going on about my business. I'm happy. That's one loan. Right. right. And, <laughs> and then we did stuff like, man, and I'm, this is just honestly, you know, uh, we did stuff like, you know, call them the day before closing or two days before closing. Like, Hey, listen, we just got something back from the lender. Um, you're going to have to, you know, bring, you know, $3,500 to closing. Mm -hmm. Well, where am I supposed to get that from? I don't know, man, but if you want to close this loan, it's going to be an extra 3,500 and they would come up with it. Yeah. Right. Of course we knew. They had to put their assets down on paper. 
Right. Not, right. Oh, oh, he got money in his 401k over here. Okay, we're going to up his fees. Right. Wow. This before, before Section 32 came in, before you could charge so many points. Man, yeah. I remember a guy named Lionel Duncan teaching me. And, uh, and, um, I won't go into the story too much because it's going another story, another way. But uh, right. I remember him, he, he was training me. Lionel Duncan was making, you know, $200,000, man. And this was back in the 90s. Like, so, you know, today that's crazy. But he was teaching investors. He taught investors how to make money uh, or how to do real estate. And he would do their loans. And mm -hmm. so uh, I, I would go by Lionel's office all the time. So he finally gave me a loan. And so, uh, you know, I was charging three, four points, you know, I, I didn't know how to sell a, you know, an eight or nine point thing. And so uh, Lionel gave me this loan. He was charging like eight points on it. If y'all don't know what a point is, a point is a percentage of the loan. Right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he's charging like eight points. And they call and the woman, I answer the phone and she's like, you know, um, I was told by a friend to ask you how many points are you charging? And I was like, okay, well, let me pull the file and I'll, I'll let you know. Hold on a second. I put it on, I'm like, I run down the hall, Lionel! Man, I got somebody on the phone, man. They, 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 they want to know how many points you're charging. So he comes in, comes in my office, literally. He puts, leans back in the seat, hits the speakerphone button, put his feet up on the desk, on my desk, right? <laughs> but, you know, and he's leaning back in the seat like this, and he's got it on speakerphone. He says, Duncan talking. That's what he, how he do it. And she's like, yeah, I just wanted to know how many points you're charging. He said, 10 points. <laughs> 10 points is what we're charging you. Now I'm just playing. We're charging you eight. And she says, Okay. <laughs> and he hung up the phone he said you always go high and then you come low wow wow <laughs> this is a true story i cannot and y'all when i'm so now i'm sitting at bank of america and i'm being trolled about predatory lending and i felt this big mm. because i was hurting my people when i really thought i was helping them right i didn't right. know it mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so um consequently man i got on the radio i wrote the book edit your credit and i began to teach people how to get their credit right Right. Mm -hmm. And and at this point, you know, I'm trying to teach them how to go through what's called conforming lending because what we were doing with subprime, well, they're both, it's both conventional prime financing, but, you know, you can qualify for conventional financing if you just do these things. And um, I wrote the book in 2002. It's a 192 page workbook. I mean, it's literally about this big, that wide, 190. It looks like a college textbook. Mm -hmm. And um, and it, it did very, very, we sold over a thousand books and this is without internet. You know, this was, this was, you know, it was pretty good. We did very, very well. And um, it became outdated. You know, I wrote it in 2002. But one of the things that I, I say is that, you know, people now tell me, oh, you need a 608 letter, you need a 611 letter, you need a 607 letter. And I'm like, man, I wrote the book on that in 2002. Like, right. like literally, like literally before there was an Amazon, before there was a Kindle publishing, before there was all this stuff. No, I had to go through a real printing press, a real printing company, a real publisher. Real publisher, yeah. <laughs> I had to really file for my ISBN number and have them give it to me and all that. Like, I really had to go through that. And, is it, you know, but now, you know, everybody today is a credit expert. And I'm like, well, y'all probably read my book on it. And so we rewrote the book. We, re we revised it, rather, last year. And um, here's volume two. I got so many books in here. Let's see here. Well, I got three books, you guys, and I don't know where they are. <laughs> <laughs> and I should have been. Oh, here they are, right here. Um, we have volume one, which is editor credit, and now we kind of made it smaller because everybody told me that the books look intimidating because people don't want to read about finance, right? So give them something that's cute and cuddly so it don't look so intimidating. So this is Editor Credit Volume 1, Insider Secrets to Excellent Credit. And so this will tell you about, um, you know, pretty much what the credit bureaus are looking for. And then we have Insider Secrets to Fighting and Winning. This is how you fight them and beat them. And it's not just about sending in a credit letter, guys. If yes, what you're doing is that's just not going to work. And then we have, finally, we have Insider Secrets to Everyday Living. And um, this is like how once you, you know, what do you do if you're single, if you're divorced, if you're a teenager, uh, if I'm a senior, uh, if I'm a newlywed, how do I maintain my credit, my lifestyle? If I file bankruptcy, you know, how do I get my credit back? And so we have three different books. You guys, you can get them. And you guys can just go to Amazon.com. You can go to MyFFU.com and you can pick those up and, uh, and get those too.
Great stuff, man. Great stuff. Yeah, I'll be, be, you know, I'll be heading right over there once we're done, so I can pick my copies up. And you don't got to just uh, email me your address, man, and I'll go ahead and send them to you. It's on me. Thank you for having me on your show. Oh man, listen, that's a blessing. I, I certainly appreciate that. I certainly appreciate that. And I was told, you know, most people would say, "Oh no, don't worry about it." You know, um, uh, my, I was told once before, "Don't, don't, don't block other people's blessings." Yeah, that's him. right. Like, blessing for him. So thank you very much. I, I certainly take that. Um, so tell the folks, how can they get in contact with you and, and how can they learn more about, you know, learning the, the tax lien business? How can they get in contact with you to learn more about that? Um, we trying to brand my FFU. So it's my FFU.com. You can see it on the banner behind me, uh, www, uh, my financial freedom university, my FFU.com. You can go on Facebook and go to facebook.com forward slash my FFU. You can call one 888 my ffu <laughs> you can go on instagram and go to my ffu right and so um we're and then uh on periscope you guys i'm financial moses i don't really go live that often i used to go like two or three times a day now i might go two or three times a quarter like <laughs> i am coming back though just we just hit a season covid man has been really a blessing to us and uh i'm really 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 this hardness is something that has been a burden for many people has really allowed me to get back in the seat and really refocus. And, um, it's just, it's been, the numbers have just been astronomical. Uh, we lost her again, Glenn, um, yeah, that's it. astronomical. And so we just launched what we call now a tax lane masterclass. Um, and that masterclass, uh, we're now going beyond tax lanes now. Um, yeah. and, and this is, you know, this allowed me, COVID allowed me to see, you know, where my weaknesses were and uh -huh. we were very 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 successful in helping people obtain property but most of the people i was dealing with were novices in real estate so i got it now what do i do with it Definitely. and you know, how do i flip it how do i make a profit from it and so we did it what's now called a tax lane master class that works in anything so now we're teaching how to analyze the deal. that's a whole course uh we're teaching um um structuring and financing your deal that's a, an entire course. And um, yeah, that's an entire course. It's, I, I tell people it's not, it's not math, it's money, right? It's not math, it's money. And then uh, we're teaching uh, making construction and rehab easy. You know, how do I make this process easy? And how do I not get robbed by contractors? Uh, and then finally, we're coming back and talk and we're, we're teaching renting, selling and profiting in real estate. And so those are four different courses and so uh, we just gave a credit concourse course. We put it in there. And then we have our tax things, 101, 201, and 301. Uh, so it's eight courses, man. We just launched four of them are live. We're teaching four of them live and four of them are pre-recorded. We have eight courses, man. And uh, we had over 200 people actually registered for this particular, uh, this course, man. So that, that was, I think, the most we ever had before. And the real estate course that was live was like 102, 103. And we literally was able to, you know, you know, double that so that was really really a blessing for us and so uh we just decided to see what god's gonna be doing with us on the next horizon and and you know how we can continue to take this and stretch it and you know get inside of the, the churches and let people know that yes you you know you are blessed you are the head not the tail that you are above and not believe you are the lender not the borrower and these are some ways that you can actually become that and do that and give them a path um, to prosperity and financial independence because that's what god nobody in the bible had a job Right, right. Real stuff, man. Real stuff. <laughs> and, and companies. Yes, yes, indeed. Well, listen, I want to thank you again, man, for coming on and taking your time out of your day to share what you know and share your information with these folks. Um, it, it is absolutely a blessing to be able to be connected to someone like yourself, too. Let's connect, man. On, on the same spiritual wavelength. You I know, know the D, too, man. Let's connect. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, man. Listen, I'm 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 looking at I'm doing some stuff in Gary, so I'm certainly gonna be coming to your town and I dare not come to your town and not connect with you. And if you don't let me feed you and you come here, man, we not talking no more. You gotta let me <laughs> I'm definitely coming, man. I'm definitely coming. Um because you know, I'm I'm actually looking at the uh the tax leagues and things like that in your area. So uh we got some things that are in process that will happen there, you know, but we want to, you know, speed up the process on that. And I know you certainly would be an asset for us to help us get that going. Whatever I can do to help you, man. It's more than enough property here. It's, when I say more, 
when we started with 18,000 properties on the tax road, this last auction was 13,000. I can't buy all 13,000 of them. My students can't buy all 13,000 of them, so come get some. Right, right. No doubt. No doubt. We're coming. We're coming, man. Listen, <laughs> appreciate it again. We're definitely going to connect, man, and, and make some things happen. I mean, I, I want to be able to, you know, if, if it's something I can do for you, man, certainly reach out to me and let me know. Uh, I'm here to serve. I'm a servant as well. So uh, whatever I can do, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm here to help you. I can you know. tell you, I mean, your kindness and and you thinking enough of me to have me on your show, man, is 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 humbling and honorable enough, man. I really, really appreciate you for reaching out. I appreciate your friendship. I appreciate the offer for being here, and I, you know, you don't, I don't take it for granted that you that you you allow me on your show, man. So I really, really, really appreciate it. Well, listen, listen for what you what you got and what you shared today, man. This will not be the last time. Uh, well, come on. I'm already looking at where I can clear the calendar at to get you back on again. <laughs> Put me on it. I'll be here. I promise. Definitely. Definitely. Again. So I thank you. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you, man. And um, we're going to connect, man. I'm, you know, we'll, we'll chop it up after this, you know, a little bit uh, and, you know, get some things going, you know, see what we can put into works and see what we can collaborate on. Okay. Sounds great. All right. Thanks again. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you all for watching. Uh, I got to say, so so when we did the flyer, my, my designer, I said, why can't you put the minister part on there? I, like, oh, <laughs> you know? I said, I said, I got I got to make sure the folks know who they dealing with here. This guy is, re is the real deal. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny because at one time I wasn't using it and then I was convicted about it. Like I was like, oh, we don't have to put minister on there, uh, you know, and I was really seriously. I was this is real talk. I was really convicted about it. And yeah. so I started putting uh, minister, and if you can't put George M. Howard Jr., then just put GM, you know, minister GM Howard Jr. I'm, I'm not stuck on names or titles. And that's why, you know, I wasn't stuck on the minister part. Like I walk in it, you should know it by my walk, not by my Man. Uh, abbreviation in front of my name. So, and, and I, it, I will tell folks, that's what I know about you. The things that I've, I've watched several of your videos and that's what I learned about you. The titles and the things are not what make you who you are because you are a true servant. You know, you are a real, you are, you know, a real servant of God, man. And I appreciate that. You know, I'm, I'm actually, uh, I'm, I'm trying to go back and see which videos I downloaded. I ain't gonna tell you that I downloaded. Man, <laughs> I man, I download them. I do it too. We all do it. We know the tricks of the trade, man. It's like, listen, I can't let this get away. It's, you know, <laughs> Periscope gonna let it go away. Facebook gonna get lost in my Facebook timeline. Let me just go ahead and, you know. <laughs> Get it while I got it now. <laughs> I'm not mad at you, man. Continue to do it. And I'm going to be taking some of your content too. So yeah. that's what we do, man. We share. And it's, it, you know, and it's, it's a blessing, man, that, you know, to know that somebody thinks enough of you to even download your stuff. Real stuff. Real stuff. Yeah. So we're going we're gonna to be sharing this again, man. You know, this will be broadcast over all of our podcast channels and on our YouTube channel. So, you know, several more people, you know, the one or two people in America that may not know about you. Uh, go get a chance to know who you are, you know, with us sharing the information that we have, you know. So, again, I thank you. I received that too. It's only going to be one or two who don't know who I am. And Jesus. Right. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Well, folks, this has been the Real Life Real Estate Investing Show where we talk about real life real estate situations, where we bring you real life real estate solutions. And uh, listen, it's hard to sign off on this phenomenal show, but I know we got to go. Uh, but I'll definitely be talking to you, Mr. Howard, and we can make some things happen. Sounds great. Thanks for having me. All right. Have a good one now. I appreciate it.